Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamana Khan, and I'm one of the directors and uh, consultant at Technovative Solutions Limited. And I would like to invite you to our webinar on bubble image capture in an organic ranking cycle, or ORC, and analysis um, using deep learning for geothermal applications. So if you don't know, the ORC, or organic ranking cycle, is a thermodynamic cycle that can be applied in waste heat recovery, renewable energy power plants, etc., using low boiling organic fluid instead of water. And this uh, webinar will discuss the image capture of organic fluid bubble in an um, ORC using a high-speed camera in uh, detecting and analyzing the dynamics of uh, the bubbles using deep learning algorithms to apply in uh, the geothermal energy sectors. And this work uh, is funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Action um, through the GeoHex project. So I would like to introduce our uh, speakers. I would like to start with uh, Dr. Mahfouza Ahmed, who is uh, the Collaborative Research Leader at Technovative Solutions Limited. Before we stole Mahfouza to our company, she she was uh, she received her PhD in Brunel, Brunel University, London, in um, radiation damage studies of silicon detectors, and then she became a full professor of physics at Sharjah University of Technology, Science and Technology in 2009 and also worked as a visiting academic at uh, University of Manchester, the University of Oxford, etc. So, so at uh, Technovative Solutions, Mafuza is uh, leading several H2020 projects, including Well Galaxy, GeoHex, and um, uh, GeoSmart, etc. Then we have Dr. Halder Palsen. Um, he's a professor at the uh, University of Iceland. So Halder uh, did his uh, CS in mechanical engineering from University of Iceland. Then he did his master's um, and PhD from uh, Technical University of Denmark. Uh, Halder became a full professor uh, at University of Iceland since uh, 2016, and he is working on subjects uh, regarding geothermal energy, utilization, fluid mechanics, uh, biomechanics, and mechanical uh, modeling in, in general. Last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Mahmoud Hassan uh, Shaikat. Uh, so he's a, a mechanical engineer at Technovative Solutions Limited. He received his bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from Bangladesh. Bangladesh University of um, uh, Engineering and Technology, or we call it uh, BUET. Um, he's um, working on multiple projects that involve mechanical system modeling, algorithm development, and machine learning in the um, renewable energy field. Uh, Mahmoud's uh, research interests include robotics, uh, mechanic, mechatronics, human-robot interactions, and renewable energy. So I would also like to mention that Mahmoud uh, will soon uh, be starting his uh, PhD at the uh, University of North Carolina, uh, uh, USA. So um, I would like to ask our audiences to um, wait uh, for the presentation to finish. And in the meantime, you can post your questions on the chat box. And if you would like to ask the questions, then please raise your hand so that I can uh, enable your microphone. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to ask Mafuza to uh, start the discussion. Okay, thank you, Tavanna. Uh, so today uh, we will present uh, some results from the uh, from one of the work package of GeoHex project. And as Tan already mentioned, uh, that uh, today we will talk about the bubble image capture and uh, analysis of the bubble image using the deep learning for geothermal applications. So let me start with objectives of GeoHex project. Uh, the, the overall objective of the GeoHex project is to develop some coating materials with anti-corrosion and anti-scaling properties uh, for the heat exchanger surfaces. This is aiming to uh, increase the uh, overall uh, uh, geothermal plant efficiency uh, just by minimizing the scaling and corrosion issues within the heat exchanger. And the other part of the objective is to say again the uh, development of coating material for the heat exchanger surfaces to uh, enhance the heat transfer performance of the heat exchanger. And this will lead to a more cost-effective system. Uh, 
So as I already mentioned that GeoHex project uh, develops high performance coating materials uh, for the evaporative surface to promote the nucleate boiling. This is because the heat transfer by nucleate boiling is several times higher than that of the conventional fill boiling. And uh, therefore GeoHex projects aims to analyze heat transfer through nucleate boiling to enhance the heat transfer performance of the evaporator. And our aim uh, of this work is to capture the images of our 134A uh, 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 bubbles, uh, uh, which are produced uh, on the standard and the GUX material coated evaporator plates um, uh, using a high speed uh, camera. And obviously, uh, we captured these images during a boiling experiment because we are talking about the bubbles and uh, uh, evaporator heat exchanger. And then develop an image processing algorithm uh, to analyze those bubbles and calculate the various bubble parameters, such as uh, nucleation site, nucleation site density, bubble diameters, bubble departure diameters, et cetera, using this developed image processing algorithm and compare the results of the standard and uh, GeoHex material coated heat exchanger plates uh, to see the impact of the GeoHex coating material. Uh, uh, TVS is developing knowledge-based decision support system uh, in the GeoHex project, and therefore the developed uh, deep learning algorithm uh, to uh, process the bubble images uh, will be a module in the decision support system uh, therefore, the user would be able to upload their video uh, in this module and calculate their, uh, you know, analyze their bubble images and calculate bubble parameters. And the other objective, uh, uh, sorry, other, other purpose of this work is to calculate the bubble parameters to, sorry, that the calculated bubble parameters will be used to uh, uh, validate the simulation of the bubble dynamics. Uh, the simulation for the bubble dynamics is being developed by other uh, partner uh, of the uh, GeoHex project. So it's uh, okay. Now, so, uh, our, yeah, uh, Halder will take over now. Yes, please, Halder, carry on. Yeah. So I will be discussing a little bit about the uh, test trick that we used for the experiments. So what you see here on the figure is the setup. It's a very compact one, so it's a single unit <clears throat> that can be pushed around, and it's a closed system. So it consists really of two streams of fluids. One is the working fluid, which is subject to the boiling process, and the other fluid is simulated brine, close, very, very similar to water, which is used for heating up the heat exchanger plate, which then leads to the boiling process. So the closed loop system is only connected to the to a power mains. Uh, the water circuit is then heated up using a boiler, which is the large cylinder you can see on the figure. And the heating or the or the boiling process is then also controlled by a condenser, which is seen on the top of the figure. So everything is then uh, controlled through a like a scatter system. And uh, with, with, a, with a display and the possibility to connect this to a computer and lock the data. And there are some controllers included, giving us the opportunity to go to adjust temperatures, flows, etc. in the system. So it's it's a good it's a good setup for making like detailed experimentations in the in the fluids. Okay. So here you can see a. Uh, schematic of the of the flow loop as it is so the so the pink uh, lines on the top these are this this is a circuit for the working fluid going through the boiling process we measure both pressure and temperature and also flow so these are the three main parameters the accuracy of the temperature measurements is around 0 0.1 degrees centigrade and for the flow it's also 0 0.1 uh, liters per minute, which is the accuracy. So this gives us the opportunity to calculate uh, resulting uh, heat transfer parameters where we are interested in the temperature differences and also flow in order to be able to calculate the heat flux, the total heat flux in the system. So temperatures of the water circuit are controlled by a bypass valve seen on the figure. So there is a pump that can be bypassed with a, with a, with a controlled uh, 
or mechanically and, and electronically controlled valve. So this gives us the opportunity to specify exactly which temperatures enter the water circuit. The same is true on the top where we have the air condenser. That one is controlled or it started and stopped in order to keep the pressure in the boiling process and in the upper loop at a constant value. So in, by doing this, we are able to simulate steady state conditions and then vary the temperature to, to mimic different steady state conditions. Okay, the test section itself in the experiment is shown on these two figures. What you can see on the left is like a top view looking through a glass on the top. And here we can see the test plate within the looking glass. So it's fixed, it's it's fixed on top of an O-ring to keep everything sealed. This has to be able to withstand both pressures up to 10 bar positive and also vacuum when we are changing plates, then we have to remove all air from the circuit and, and then load it with the working fluid, which in this case is, is the refrigerant R134A. Uh, in the middle picture, you can see here the different sections. We have this big looking glass, as I mentioned before, on the top, but it's also possible to view the test plate from the side. <clears throat> so the idea here was to use one hole for uh, applying light and then making it possible to take pictures from the side. There are two other very small uh, inserts for looking at what is going on, but they were actually not used in these experiments. Okay, the heat exchanger plates, so the plates that are subject to the tests are shown here, and in the uh, bubble capture experiments we used really uh, just a couple of different plates. One was uncoated stainless steel, which is seen on the left, and the other one was coated with oleophilic uh, coating. And it's like a patent-like coating, and the idea was to make a pattern of both oleophilic and oleophobic uh, surfaces using these high-tech coatings in order to promote uh, boiling. It actually turned out that this part of this is on a millimeter scale, but probably something on a on a micrometer scale is 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 needed to get this process really uh, as it as it should be. So the plates they have a thickness of six millimeters, and they can be exchanged in a, about an hour. So so it's it's relatively easy to change samples when we are doing the experiments. This figure shows the camera that was used to obtain the bubble images and bubble videos. It's a high-speed camera uh, with an availability of a very high number of frames per second, but in this experiment it turned out that the fitting number was about 600 frames per second. The camera has, has a manual focus and, a, and, a, and has fixed apertures along different amount of lights into the camera, but, but they can be manually changed if needed. So I think uh, you will get more information later regarding that. For the lighting, an LED ring was used either fixed on the front of the lens of the camera, or in some cases it was more appropriate to move the ring closer to the plate to get as much light as possible into the measuring chambers, because this turned out to be a little bit of an issue to get enough light to 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 yeah to obtain the uh, good good images of the process. OK, uh, this slide shows us a setup where we had to insert a, like a small device into the chamber, and the idea here was to be able to take pictures of the boiling process on the plates. The thing is that there's a liquid vapor surface inside the chamber here. It's not filled with liquid because there is boiling taking place on the plate. And when the boil, when the bubbles hit the surface, they disrupt it, and it's very difficult to see any clear images through it. So what we did here, we made like a plastic scaffold and then inserted a, like a glass tube with a, with a bottom into the fluid. 
And by doing that, we were able to see, see much more clearly what is going on close to the plate. So this was one of the additions that we had to make like during the process of the image capturing. And here you can see a setup, both on the left side, where we have a, like a vertical position of the camera, pointing the lens downwards and up applying light from the uh, end of the lens. And this was just to get images of the, of the straight from the top of the plate and what was going on. And on the picture, figure on the, on the right, we are applying light from the top and then taking pictures from the side. And the zoom level of the camera cannot really be seen here, but, but by doing this, we could see around one square centimeter of an image close to the plate or, or something close to that. But, but the focus limit was, was, was made it uh, a little bit difficult to position the camera in, in some cases. So these are the, basically the two setups that we tested. Uh, in order to get the images for the for the bubble capturing work. Thank you, Halder. Uh, Halder just explained uh, that we had uh, two setup for capturing bubble videos. Uh, one was the uh, top view setup, and the other was the uh, side view setup. So this is the bubble video footage uh, for the uncoated plate, and uh, this is uh, for the top view uh, setup. So let me uh, play the video. Uh, yeah, you are seeing that uh, bubbles are uh, generating from the heated surface and uh, rising. And uh, let me uh, focus. Yeah, uh, let's see that point. You, you see that there is a point uh, from where some discrete uh, vapor bubbles are generating. Uh, I have pointed my cursor in there. Uh, I can show you another point. Yeah, there's one more generating from here as well. Yeah, you see the discrete bubbles are generating uh, from a point uh, of the heated surface. Uh, this is called, this is, we called a, a nucleation site. And uh, we are seeing that more uh, nucleation sites are uh, popping up. You see one more here and one more there. So, yeah. And yeah, so as the bubbles are generating from the nucleation site, uh, they are rising and they are growing as well as they are rising. Uh, that means their parameters also increases. And we are also seeing some uh, coalescence event to occur. Uh, that is uh, two or more bubbles are merging together uh, to form a, uh, larger bubbles. So the rising, uh, the, the growing of the bubbles, that is the increases of the bu bubble diameters and the coalescence event all are expected uh, in a bubble dynamics. So yeah, that is all I had to show uh, for this video. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So yeah, this is the bubble video footage, uh, uh, the coated plate, and again uh, uh, for the uh, job view uh, setup. Uh, let's play the video. You see here as well, the bubbles are generating and rising. Uh, but uh, we really can't see any uh, nucleation site uh, clearly. That means we are seeing some tiny bubbles are generating um, from the heated surfaces, uh, but not really exactly, uh, you know, the, the origin where they are um, generating. So clearly the nucleation sites are not visible here uh, in this video, as we have seen in the previous video for the uncoated plate. Uh, this is because you know, you can see that the coating pattern, um, you know, the, the, the something to do with obviously the coating pattern clearly. Uh, the, the color of the uh, bubble uh, bubbles and the color of the coating, uh, coating pattern are, are almost identical. And specifically uh, the smaller bubbles. You see that the smaller bubbles, the size and the color of the smaller bubbles are pretty much similar to the, uh, to the color and the size of the color, uh, you know, the the, uh, the coating beads here. You see the coating beads here, so they are uh, pretty much similar. Uh, therefore, we are clearly seeing uh, the absence of contrast uh, between the bubble and the rest of the images. However, uh, it is uh, very important to 
or to the uh, to um, you know, the presence of a uh, of, uh, the contrast uh, between the object and the rest of the image uh, to have a, a better object detection. So which which we are not seeing here, you know. And um, so we will see uh, uh, the impact uh, or the absence of the contrast uh, will impact the results uh, for the quarter plate. And we will talk about this uh, uh, when we will uh, when talk about the result uh, in the later uh, slides. Um, yeah, so as we have seen in the previous slide that the bubbles are uh, generating from the nucleation side, they are rising and they are growing. Uh, that means the diameter also increases and we're seeing some coalescence even to occur uh, as expected during the bubble dynamics. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, let's stop the video, then we'll start the video again. So this is the uh, bubble video footage, uh, which was captured from the side view setup. And let's uh, play the video and um, we see that the bubbles are not at all uh, prominent as they were um, seen uh, during the uh, top view experiment, you know, or the top view um, video. We I just showed you, uh, you know, the, the videos uh, before. Um, yeah, this is because uh, we use the larger aperture. Uh, therefore, because of using the larger aperture, we lost the depth of field and therefore the bubbles were out of focus. Uh, for the top view videos, uh, we use the smaller aperture. Um, we also tried uh, the smaller aperture uh, for the side view as well. However, um, we didn't see anything on the screen. Uh, the screen was completely dark. Uh, therefore, we had to use the larger aperture to allow some light and to see the bubbles. Uh, however, as you know, that the, if you use the larger aperture, you know the the larger the aperture, the smaller the uh, depth of field, they probably lost the depth of field and uh, the bubbles were out of focus. Uh, because the bubbles uh, were out of focus and the video is not good, that's why I didn't analyze this video. So image processing algorithm, um, we developed a deep learning algorithm to analyze uh, the bubble videos. Uh, now uh, the, this will explain by Mahmoud how we develop the uh, deep learning algorithm. Mahmoud, over to you. Thank you, Mahfuza. So uh, right now I will talk about the image processing algorithm that we have developed for detecting the bubbles. Um, uh, so at first, let me talk about what is deep learning. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which itself is a subset of artificial intelligence. So in order to understand what deep learning is, we have to understand what neural network is because uh, uh, deep learning mainly consists of neural networks, deep neural networks. So as you can see in the right, right side photo, uh, this is a photo of uh, a neural network. And a uh, neural network means, uh, basically just means that it's a network of neurons. Uh, as you can see, it's um, you know arranged in different layers. Uh, here we can see five layers, the input layer, output layer, and uh, we have three layers in between. So each of these circles that you can see, they, they, are, the, they are the neurons, or we can also call them nodes. And uh, as you can see, all of them are interconnected with each other, uh, just like you know uh, the neural network, uh, the name of it came from uh, the animal brains and how they learn. So there, are, there is uh, a connection Shukut, between neurons. Shukut, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, there yeah. are some comments that uh, they cannot see the uh, image you are sharing. Okay, uh, but so, I can see it. Can you can you see it, Mafuza Halder? Can uh, you see it? No, I can't. Okay, so uh, would you like to uh, share your screen, maybe? Yeah, I can do that. You can try. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Then um, uh, let's talk about it from the beginning. Okay. So I was talking about deep learning. So deep learning mainly consists of uh, deep neural networks, and uh, you know, uh, uh, in the right side of uh, in the right 
uh, right photo that you can see right now. Uh, we have a neural network and uh, in the neural networks, uh, neural network basically means that it's a network of neurons. And uh, you can see we have these uh, circular things that are the neurons, or we can also call them as nodes. And these are uh, all interconnected with each other and they are arranged in um, uh, some number of layers. For example, we have five layers here, including the input and the output layers. So uh, neural network uh, is, uh, its name comes from, you know, the animal's um, brain uh, and how they learn. Uh, just like the neurons, uh, they are connected with each other. So uh, that's how the neural network mainly uh, uh, comes to be. And uh, uh, <coughs> the neural network, if you provide some input data uh, in the input layer, for example, you provide some images of, let's say, dogs and cats, and uh, you tell the, um, uh, you tell the network in the output layer that this is a photo of the dog and this is the photo of the cat. And when you have enough data, then uh, the neural network will automatically find the relation between the input and the outputs. Uh, just like, you know, we can use uh, an analogy here um, that is uh, in the childhood when, uh, you know, your parents taught you uh, that this is, uh, this is dog and this is the cat. Uh, that's just like that. Uh, when we have enough data, then, uh, uh, the neural network can also learn to distinguish between uh, the picture of dogs and cat and you know it, it applies also in other concepts as well <clears throat> not only just uh, uh, photos of dogs and cats so uh, there are uh, uh, lots of different uh, types of neural networks um, and uh, they are used for different types of applications for example you know uh, the one we have used is called a cnn or a convolutional neural network this is mainly good for you know, photos, speech, and audios, uh, this kind of things. And uh, you can see the R here, right? R is for the region-based uh, uh, region uh, convolutional neural network. So the name of the method is the mask RCNN method. And in this method, uh, the image is segmented in uh, different parts and uh, the, you know, the algorithm can recognize uh, each and every part of the image. For example, you can see different parts of uh, this image is uh, classified, you know, as uh, wherever the cars are, the image has, image have classified, uh, sorry, the algorithm had classified the images as cars. Okay, so uh, now let's move on to uh, how our algorithm, you know, works. Uh, uh, in our algorithm, uh, we have, you know, we have to first uh, configure the detector configuration. That is, uh, we are uh, just telling the algorithm that this is going to be our image height and width and other parameters. We have also fixed them. Then uh, we have taken the bubble image data set, which is just the experimental video that Mahfuzah showed you earlier. And then we have prepared the data set. Uh, for example, we have, you know, uh, trimmed the video for, um, you know, to work with uh, a uh, workable uh, data set. Uh, so it's not huge. So after that, we have also, you know, transformed and annotated the data set. Uh, uh, annotation just means we we, you know, tell the algorithm that this is the bubble and this is the thing that you are going to look for. Uh, if I skip ahead, uh, this is the annotation. As you can see, this is the unannotated image in the left and in the right, we have the annotated image. And we have just marked the images uh, to tell the algorithm that these are the bubbles and uh, this is the thing that we're looking for. So, yeah, let's go back. And uh, this is, uh, this consists, um, uh, you know, this is the preposing step of our algorithm. Uh, and then we go to the training, testing, and validation uh, part of the model. So uh, uh, in this step, we you know we take the data set and divide them uh, into training and testing data set. Training just means you, you know you are just uh, taking the photos uh, and telling the algorithm that this is the photo of a dog and this is the photo of a cat. These are the training data set, and this is how we train the models. So we have to, uh, you know, separate our trained data so we can test our um, model later with new images. So after that, we, you know, load the pre-trained model, uh, which is the mask RCNN model. Then we train it uh, for 30 iterations, and then we, you know, load the last uh, model that is the most accurate model. And after that, we try to, you know, validate our model. Uh, and uh, validation just means that we are looking uh, for, you know, if the if our algorithm has uh, or can detect bubbles properly or not. So after that, we go to the post-processing stage, which just consists of uh, tracking and analysis. In the tracking stage, we just, you know, each of the detected bubbles that our algorithm detected, uh, you know, we draw uh, a circle around those bubbles, and we also calculate 
uh, the ready radius uh, then uh, the center uh, coordinates of those bubbles in our analysis stage and, and that's how our algorithm works now uh, we have basically uh, mentioned uh, this in detail here uh, we just um, in every machine learning problem we have a data set and we then uh, train uh, those data sets uh, uh, according to our you know problem and then we test using some new images or data set uh, then uh, we go to tracking which is uh, just you know we uh, track those bubbles which are detected by the algorithms uh, in each frame uh, and we uh, perform some kind of analysis after um, you know detecting the bubbles so yeah i talked about this slide already this is just the annotation and uh, yeah uh, after all of that uh, we have the results here uh, our algorithm can you know as you can see uh, it's a still picture right now but i will play the video in a bit uh, you can see our algorithm has detected most of the bubbles uh, but you can also see that some of the bubbles were not you know recognized uh, this mainly happens because of you know uh, there are some kind of overlaps between some of the bubbles that were not detected by our algorithm and also uh, some of the bubbles are just too blurry to detect so, and some of them are too small to detect so that's why uh, but i think uh, it uh, still does a very good job of detecting most of the bubbles so as you can see the video is running right now and the algorithm is able to detect uh, most of the bubbles and you will also see um, um, yeah in this picture uh, this is actually uh, how we calculated calculated the accuracy of our algorithm or accuracy of bubble detection in the upper side of uh, the slide uh, the two pictures you see side by side are the pictures of uncoated bullet. And as you can see, our algorithm is pretty good at detecting the bubbles. Um, and uh, in the right side, uh, in the left side, uh, in the green markers, we have the algorithm uh, that detected these bubbles. And in the right side, we have, you know, we have manually uh, calculated these bubbles uh, just with our naked eyes. And then after that, we calculated both of these numbers to see how much, uh, how accurate our algorithm is uh, in detecting bubbles. So just like that, uh, in the you know lower section of this slide, you can see the um, you can see the images of the coated plates, and we have calculated the accuracy just like um, we did uh, for the uncoated plate. So yeah, uh, this just uh, tells you who, who, how we do it. We manually count the number of bubbles uh, just by you know uh, counting them, uh, and then we compare with uh, compare the number with the predicted number of bubbles uh, by the algorithm, and then we calculate the accuracy just by dividing them. Also, obviously, we have some you know uh, here you can see that without FP, this FP actually means false positive. Sometimes, uh, what our algorithm does is it you know uh, detects some uh, you know. Uh, glitches like uh, there there were not uh, any bubbles but it still detected some bubbles uh, this doesn't happen too often and uh, it is uh, it's like uh, one percent probably but uh, we still uh, count them out and we calculate the accuracy from there and this 90 percent is just an arbitrary value so now let's move on to the next slide and you know this is uh, a part of our analysis uh, we evaluate um, the number of nucleation sites uh, using um, k-means clustering, clustering algorithm which is also an unsupervised machine learning algorithm uh, which means you do not know uh, how many nucleation sites there are but you just you know you have to iterate uh, using different number of nucleation sites or clusters um, as we are talking in the uh, perspective of k-means clustering algorithm so uh, we uh, take different number of nucleation sites and then run our algorithm through it and uh, see which one uh, gives us the most accurate result and that's how we estimate the number of nucleation sites from our algorithm and as you can see uh, these are the nucleation sites that were uh, generated with uh, our algorithm we have pointed with uh, pointed them with uh, red dots so now um, now I would like to hand over the presentation to Haldar and uh, he will talk about the experimental results. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, see. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing. Mm -hmm. So, 
I'm going to discuss uh, results from the heat transfer calculations. There were two parameters that we were interested in. Uh, one is the heat flux through the sample plate that we're using, and this is just a standardized value per square meter of heat transfer uh, area. And the figure on the left shows the results for the heat flux, and this has then been done for different coatings, but always comparing the coatings to uh, uncoated samples. And the blue line that you see here is the is like an average value for the uncoated samples, accompanied by this uh, shaded area, which is the 95% confidence interval of the measurements. And we, we can see here that the actual measurements for the uncoated sample, they fit very well to the line. But what can also be seen is that when we compare this to two coated samples, one is coated with this bio-oleophilic uh, coating that, that we have been, that were used in the bubble capturing work. This has been tested with two different coatings on the brine side, and there seems to be very little difference between the coatings with amorphous one coating on the brine side and the uncoated one. Uh, the other coating, Amorphous 2 on the brine side, shows uh, like a marginal improvement. It's very close to the confidence line, but it's difficult to say with any certainty that this is like a like a this is a real improvement. So so, but but there is a tendency to 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 think that in a way. Uh, this of course shows that it doesn't really show any difference for the coating on the brine, on, on the working fluid side where the boiling is taking place. So in this case, that doesn't, it doesn't seem to be, seem to be any improvement on that case. On the right, we can see then the overall heat transfer coefficient, which is denoted by U. This is also in the unit kilowatts per square meters, but also per Kelvin or per de degree centigrade. And I didn't mention, the, okay, this says that this is the stainless steel plate. But here you can see a little bit more clearly how the uh, amorphous two coating on the brine side seems to be marginally better. So there is a, there's a slight difference, but, but it seems to be due to the improvement on the brine, on the brine side, but not on the working fluid side. So this actually reaches a maximum close to the temperature difference of between 40 and 45 degrees. Uh, but the machinery didn't allow us to get to higher temperature difference than that. So we can see at least there's a clear change due to the different uh, uh, mechanism in the nucleus boiling taking place partially and also due to the different coatings on the on the brine side. Okay. So this, I think you can then continue. Yes, uh, I'm there. Uh, uh, can I take control? Or I can share as well. Uh, all right, okay, let me continue the way just, yeah. So the next, uh, uh, this is a very interesting analysis. Uh, you can see that the plots on the left hand side, uh, which is the bubble diameters histogram for the coated plate, and the plots on the right side, uh, which are the which is the um, histogram for the uh, bubble uh, uh, histogram of bubble diameters for the uncoated plate. Uh, let me focus on the <clears throat> top uh, plot first. Um, you see that uh, in the distribution. <clears throat> Uh, the peak appeared uh, on the left side, and the distribution is not symmetrical around the peak. Uh, for both the plots, um, you know, we are seeing the same thing. Um, and there is a, a tail uh, on the right side of the peak. So this type of distribution is consistent uh, with the long normal distribution. So now if you take uh, uh, or convert the x-axis to a log scale, then the distribution will appear as a uh, normal distribution. Then what we did, 
We then uh, take the convert x axis to a log scale. You can see the bottom now, let focus on the bottom plates now. You can see the x axis now converted to a log scale. Yeah. And the peak, peak is now shifted to the right. And the distribution uh, on the both sides of the peak is symmetrical. You see that, that the peak is now, uh, you know, the distribution is now symmetrical around the peak for both the plots. So, which is a normal distribution. So, that's a really very interesting result. And uh, this is uh, agreed well with the literature as well. Uh, other bubbles like water bubbles also, um, you know, there, um, I, I saw many uh, literature that the bubble di diameter distribution, uh, their distribution also consisted with a log number distribution. And then when they converted the x-axis to a uh, log scale, that became a normal distribution. So this result is really, really consistent with the, with the literature results for any bubble uh, any uh, diameters. So and then come to the final slide, I think, uh, bubble parameter results. Uh, we have calculated the departure diameter, uh, departure frequency, nucleation site, active nucleation site density. And already uh, uh, Mahmoud showed you that we calculate the uh, bubble detection accuracy as well. You see that the bubble departure diameter, uh, these two results are very close for the coated and uncoated plate. These are within 3%. Uh, but uh, uh, the departure frequency, nucleation side, and active nucleation side, they are, you know, uh, about, uh, I think the departure frequency is 18%. And nucleation side and nucleation side density uh, is uh, about 16%. Uh, uh, lower than that uh, uh, calculated uh, for the uncoated plate. And we can also see, you know, that the bubble detection accuracy, that, they, that is the, the number of bubble detected uh, for the coated plate, uh, which is also lower by 70% than uh, detected uh, in the uncoated plate. These three parameters, in the, the departure frequency, nucleation site, and active nucleation site density, these three parameters um, were calculated using the number of bubbles detected. So we are seeing same sort of errors uh, in these parameters as well as, you know, uh, they, uh, this is uh, uh, bubble detection accuracy is lowered by 18 to 70%, and these parameters are also lowered by, you know, about 18 to 16% uh, than those calculated by the uncoated plate. And while I was showing the video uh, for the coated plate, um, I, I, you know that uh, we mentioned and we saw that the uh, contrast uh, between the bubble and the rest of, it, rest of the images uh, was ab absent. It was really very difficult to, uh, you know, see that really the smaller bubbles was really, really difficult to distinguish. So we think uh, the lower, we think now, we, we believe that the lower detection uh, Mm, you know, in the coated plate uh, is uh, is to do with the with the coating pattern, and that's impacted on these results as well because these three results also use the uh, bubble uh, number of bubble detections. So, if we consider the results of uh, uh, heat transfer performance uh, for the coated and uncoated plate, as Halder mentioned that. Uh, um, you know, there isn't any significant difference between the coated and uncoated plate with respect to heat transfer coefficient. And we are seeing also that the, the bubble departure diameter, uh, which is also uh, identical or also with just only within 3%. And if you consider that these values were underestimated, uh, obviously uh, there are more bubbles. We think there are more bubbles than been detected, than, we, than the code were able to detect it. Um, because of the contrast, uh, it was not possible to detect all the bubbles. So, so considering these two results, the bubble diameter and uh, the heat transfer performance of this uh, plate, we can conclude that there isn't any significant uh, difference between the uh, coated and uncoated plate uh, with respect to heat transfer performance and the, and obviously the, 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 with, the, with the bubble parameters. So thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mahfouza Halder and um, Sheikhat. We have a few questions from the audience, so I'm going to uh, give the floor to MD Sherkar. So I'm allowing you uh, the mic, and he has some questions on the deep learning method. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, ma'am. Uh, actually, I'm a, a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford. I'm a direct student of Dr. Mahfouza Sherkar. So I'm, I've been working for deep learning since uh, 10 years. Uh, so I have some suggestion actually, uh, because uh, the model that uh, like, uh, I think uh, you use like mask or CNN, yeah. uh, which is going to have like the frame by frame, you know, like as a email. So your background and foreground targeted object and the background is very similar. So in this scenario, I can suggest like uh, go for some uh, temporal sequencing object detector models because you have the video. So the bubbles are starting and the, the radius of the bubbles are increasing. So this information is very useful to have like the, you don't need to track later, you know, like you have like the model that can uh, learn this information with the video sequence. It's not like frame by frame. So you, if you guys can use like the uh, video 3D object detector, that can help you to detect all these small objects as as well as like the larger object as well. So because this is you know like transforming throughout the background, even though the, there is a coated background is complex, but the bubbles are you know like uh, changing the shapes. Uh, that is the most um, important information from the network to learn. If you see if you if you give the network only one image, it confused. Even human should confuse with this. But if you have the multiple sequence of the image that there is a change between every frames are happening, that, uh, you know, emphasize the network to learn more accurately and can get you the good results. Yeah, okay. thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank you, Mustafa, for joining our webinar. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much. Uh, we're really good to have you here and have your comments. And um, so, yeah, uh, uh, any, anything, Mahmoud, from your side? Yeah, I think uh, uh, what he said is uh, really good. It's a great solution yeah. that, you know, uh, because essentially our background is, you know, static. So yeah, we only of have course. The moving, moving, moving is dynamic. Is, yeah, bubbles yeah, is dynamic. Only the moving thing is the bubble. So it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we, are, we are actually static. analyzing frame by frame, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like when you have yeah, right. video, yeah, uh, the the mask or CNN or others uh, you know, like frame by frame models are not really very good. Yeah. So in in terms of video, you have to go for video uh, of the detection models that can yeah, help you. Some for... models, uh, specific models. And one thing also, you know, there is a uh, back uh, the CNN models are you know like mostly uh, global representation. So there is new models come with transformers, which is also local. So people are also fusing them like uh, CNN and transformers. And there is uh, many of the models that you can search uh, on GitHub and papers on ICLR, CVPR. They are doing like uh, uh, temporal uh, object detection, things like that. Actually, I forget, I, I, I have something, but I will, I will write to ma'am, yeah. About yeah, sure, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, will I will contact you. Okay. Uh, and I think I remember I was talking to you one time, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's the um, reason but, I, I was yeah, interested but, uh, to, to Thank you so much, but uh, we didn't really have time to go back to, you know. No worries, ma'am, thank you. Share, so but of course, thank you so much for joining and for your uh, suggestions and uh, your uh, understanding uh, to sharing with us. Okay, we will follow your uh, recommendations. Thank, thank you. you thank you so much. Um, in chat, we have uh, a question from Hi. So Hi, I'm going to give you the floor. Let me just make you, uh, yeah, allow your mic and then you can ask the question by yourself. Hi, you are uh, muted. Would you like to ask the question? Uh, could you please unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, I guess Hi is having some difficulty, but I can read his question. It is, uh, visualizing and detecting the bubble droplets generating on the boiling surfaces with their properties such as size, time, density, and other using high-speed camera and deep learning techniques. It happened to, on boiling experiments. Would it be possible to generate and detect the droplets in the condensation experiments? 
Uh, yes, definitely. We, we are also working on the condensation experiment as well. Halder? Oh, yeah, Halder is Halder actually working on the boiling. Yeah, we were uh, we were working on the uh, but uh, for our project uh, there were some uh, some problems. Uh, but the, the even that the code we developed, uh, we also analyzed uh, some con, uh, you know some detect some uh, uh, you know um, some um, droplets as well and analyzed some droplets as well uh, because we captured uh, some droplet images. Uh, uh, you know, from uh, I think from uh, from University of some, somewhere at the University in America, uh, we done the experiment and uh, one of our colleagues did this actually, and captured the conden uh, droplet uh, uh, images or video from the condensation experiment, uh, and we also analyzed uh, this video. Easy, I think we used OpenCV and also we used uh, we tried with the uh, with the uh, deep learning as well. Um, yeah, but that was uh, from the uh, from the water, that that droplet water. So of course, yeah. I I think uh, you got your answer, or thanks. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I cannot see any other questions, but um, if uh, ha if you have any question, please raise your hands, then I can enable your uh, microphone. Uh, well, I have a question uh, to Halder, uh, really. So it's about your experiment. Uh, it's, it seems like the marginal improvement in heat transfer is due to different coatings on the brine side, but is it possible that there is also an improvement on the working fluid slide, even if it's uh, not apparent in the uh, results? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I must say that, uh, I mean, we, we cannot really distinct the two because we don't measure the plate temperature directly. So it was difficult to really to see or to measure directly, um, for example, the heat transfer coefficient or, or the convex, convection coefficient on one side and the other. So that was a bit of an issue. But actually what, what, what we did also was to, was to estimate these convection coefficients just using uh, equations from theory and also some CFD calculations. And what turns out is that the convection coefficient <clears throat> on the brine side is more or less constant at uh, roughly four kilowatts per square meter Kelvin. That's the convection coefficient H. Uh, the coefficient for the for the working fluid varies a lot. And for most of the time, it's under four kilowatts per square meter. Kelvin. So it becomes dominant, which exactly means that the water or the brine co convection coefficient is the critical one. It's safe to say that. So, so even though we had more accurate temperature measure measurements, we would probably be seeing more the effects on the brine side because of this, because H is, is lower it's going to get more critical when we look at the overall heat transfer coefficient. So I think that, that more or less is, is my taking on, on, the, on this fact. So, so we would have to do this differently really to, in order to figure out if, it's, if there's any difference on the, on the working fluid side. Okay. Thank you, Halder. Um, well, I think um, Shoikot, you, you worked on the deep learning uh, method, and I'm just wondering, uh, yeah. is there any other methods that could have been used for the analysis of the bubble images? And uh, yeah, if, yeah, yeah, if yes, then why didn't you use those methods? Okay, so yeah, there are some methods that you can use uh, apart from deep learning as well. Uh, for example, uh, you know, you could use some uh, imagery techniques, experimental imagery techniques, for example, uh, like um, shadow image velocimetry, and um, which is a form of, you know, particle image velocimetry. And uh, if you want to really do it uh, after, you know, you capture the video and then you want to do it uh, on the software side, then you can uh, definitely uh, probably use some software or uh, packages like OpenCV. Uh, which is a Python package for you know uh, image uh, processing the images. Uh, but 
uh, in this in this type of you know methods, uh, especially for OpenCV. Uh, OpenCV is like rigid; it's not uh, you know uh, not for complex problems such as uh, you know detecting bubbles, uh, because you know bubbles can be uh, they are not just circles; you know they can be you know uh, of different shapes. Then they are you know coalescing. Then uh, uh, many things are happening there, and there's uh, lots of bubbles uh, there that are you know overlapping each other. So this kind of complex problems uh, require you know lots of data sets uh, and uh, you know opencv is uh, like uh, it's pre written code that you know it cannot transfer, transform uh, but uh, on the other hand deep learning can you know learn from your data so if you for example had some kind of other bubbles uh, here we have um, uh, the r134a bubble for uh, but uh, let's say you have some other kind of bubbles that are very different from these kind of bubbles then you could also train your algorithm for those sort of uh, bubbles as well. So I think deep learning is very flexible and uh, it tackles very complex problems really well. That's why we, uh, you know, go with the deep learning method uh, uh, rather than using OpenCV or any kind of other methods. So I thank hope you. that answer is. Yeah, thank question. you. Thank you, Shekhar. So, uh, well, we we have uh, three more minutes and I have my last question to Mafuza. We always talk about, you know, exploitation or uh, kind of uh, uh, transferring uh, a technology to other industries. So I'm I'm wondering the deep uh, learning algorithm that you developed for the geothermal uh, application. Is it possible uh, to apply this uh, in any other industry besides uh, the geothermal energy? Oh yeah, yes, of course. Uh, of course, we actually already uh, while we are uh, you know developing the algorithm. We also already tried uh, some, uh, I think, uh, some uh, images of uh, blood cells. So, and uh, it was able to detect it. Uh, I don't remember the percentage, but uh, it was really very good detections uh, for the blood cells as well. So, and obviously, water bubble, you know, for any industries, it, you know, will be able to detect, obviously. Yeah, of course, I think, yeah, this okay. algorithm. Would be able to detect uh, any uh, bubbles to any industri industries. Thank you, Mafuza. So uh, we have a question from uh, MD Sarkar. So, sorry, ma'am, just uh, uh, getting a, a bit of last uh, interruption. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, like when you say to uh, the audience that you develop the algorithm, then the algorithm should be your own. So, the framework, I think it should be the framework. Yeah, like you are developing the framework to solve the some problem. If the yeah. algorithm is your own, that's not using like mask or RCNN. You need to develop an entire new algorithm with your own convolution, own things, everything, you know. So that, yeah. then, you know, like uh, like uh, us, if we uh, if you sound like, oh, you have developed a new algorithm, but it's, it says like it's mask, mask or CNN, which is different algorithm. So I think that should be, you know, like the, framework or, or even if you uh, want to develop something new you can base you can develop this but based on uh, something you know uh, you, you know on top of that one so i'm i'm just you know like telling yeah i think i would have to disagree with that uh, yeah uh, yeah because you know, just, algorithm just, can be used in a very broad sense uh, for example you know uh, we used mask scene that's all right but you know we also incorporated many of our own analysis techniques yeah, that, that's anything. called framework. That's called fra yeah. framework. Yeah. Uh, we are calling it, uh, 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 Mustafa, we are calling it algorithm because uh, uh, according to our project, uh, okay. uh, that's the name we need to call it. Okay, okay. thank you, ma'am. Yeah, no, according okay. to task, uh, that's a requirement, okay? Okay. So uh, we are within our framework uh, with respect to, you know, uh, the uh, project uh, bindings or project uh, implementation. Yeah, yeah. But, no, no, uh, I understand. But, but yeah, actually, it can be applicable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, actually. Thank you for sharing. Oh, oh, no, no. Yeah. When we we do the review of the paper from different uh, journals, so if, yeah. if someone says, "Oh, we develop the algorithm," that should be their own algorithm. So the there is. Uh, if, if I this understood is not, your point. Yeah, yeah, I got your point now. Yes, of course. <laughs> Okay, sorry, ma'am. Okay, yes. thank you so and much. That's perfectly fine for sharing. That was yeah. also, a, you know, a good to learn. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, we are at the end of our um, webinar. 
I would just like to ask our speakers to have uh, share any closing remarks. So I would like to uh, start with uh, Mahboud um, Shoykot. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, the work that we did, uh, I would say uh, it applies uh, uh, mostly, I would not see it as a as something that we you know did for you know heat transfer performance uh, examination or evaluation. I would more uh, I would more um, see it as you know uh, like um, we detected some bubbles uh, and then we you know uh, tried to analyze their parameters. Uh, then um, uh, maybe it transforms uh, pretty well. Uh, in terms of you know heat transfer performance, but we cannot you know we do, did not perform uh, our study specifically for that kind of reasons. Uh, but I would say that you know uh, um, the things that we did, uh, you cannot develop everything from the beginning. For example, you have to you know build on some somebody uh, somebody else's work. So uh, yeah, that that's uh, I think that's what we did and. I think our algorithm detects uh, the bubbles pretty well, but uh, there are also a lot of room for improvement as well. So that's it. Uh, that's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chekhat. Uh, Halder, any, any closing remarks? Yeah, just in general, uh, the GeoHux project has been very interesting to to work on. So uh, and just to add on what the, what the results that I showed is that we also tested this on uh, <clears throat> carbon steel plates and that actually gave like a important improvement in the heat transfer coefficient but but again it seemed to be more related to the brine side rather than the rather, rather than the working fluid side where the boiling takes place so it was like a similar result there but at least it's interesting to see that the bubble imaging or, or dynamics capturing uh, didn't show any any re, like real difference between the uncoated and coated sample. Now that more or less fits with the results from the heat transfer calculations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Halder. And Mafusa, uh, any closing remarks? Yeah. <clears throat> I would say uh, about the uh, bubble image capture. I think I, Halder remember we had to do a lot of uh, uh, you know meetings and. Uh, communications and then we visited uh, uh, Iceland uh, during uh, I think uh, uh, almost COVID, COVID wasn't over on the time yet. Do you remember all that? And yeah, it was I think the bubble capture um, uh, was really, really very challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did it that that's uh, that's that's one success, I think, for, uh, you know, uh, from the GeoX project because it was uh, really very uh, everybody was uh, uh, really ch thinking about it. Or should we be able to do that or not? Uh, and we did it. And then, uh, and obviously, as Mahmoud said, that uh, uh, you know, the in the algorithm there is obviously a room for the improvement. And also, as uh, Mustafa uh, shared her, his uh, uh, some recommendation and opinion, to how can we improve it further? Uh, but still, uh, the, the, so far we did uh, we did a really very good job uh, for the GeoHex project, uh, um, and uh, yeah, the, the, uh, I'm I'm happy uh, the way we did the work uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So uh, on that note, I would like to end this presentation. Good luck with the GeoHex project. It's coming to an end very soon and hopefully we'll see more results um, coming. So uh, thank you, uh, our attendees and also our presenters uh, for uh, presenting their work and also asking uh, very effective, uh, good questions and uh, nice suggestions from our audience. Thank you very much. And the recording of this webinar will be available soon. Um, so I'll contact you as soon as the recording is available. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Samanna. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Holder and Mahmoud. Bye.